All right, last week we were in Galatians 5, 13 to 15, and we talked about the new restraint. The reason we talked about the new restraint is if we are no longer like Paul teaches, if we are no longer under the law of Moses, then what restrains us from a living badly? And uh, because God isn't wanting us to go out and live like the devil. So, in the Old Testament, the law of Moses restrained people. There are certain things you did under the law of Moses get you stoned to death. And uh, that's kind of a restraint. I heard one preacher teach one time. I uh, don't know where he got the information. I don't know if he was accurate or not. He's a good friend of mine, uh, but uh, and he's a great teacher. But he taught one time when they stoned an adulterer to death, they didn't throw little rocks. They threw some pretty good-sized rocks. And they kept throwing them until the body was covered. Now, the body was buried, so to speak, right there. And the purpose of that, he said, was so if this guy left, snuck out of his house with his wife, snuck out and was heading over to his neighbor's wife, and he happened to walk by this pile of rocks, he might have second thoughts. Being stoned to death for adultery was a restraint. Paul teaches we're not under the law of Moses, so what restrains us? He taught, he, uh, taught us that last week's lesson, uh, looking at the review, verse 13 of Galatians 5, Christ has set us free. Now this means we are really free. Now hold on to your freedom and don't ever become slaves of the law again. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus, when asked what the greatest commandment was, said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And he said the second like unto it, Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said a peculiar thing. He said, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In the Old Testament, they were so intent, intently trying to keep the rules of the law of Moses that they never understood there were two rules back then that would have made keeping those other rules easier. And that is to love God with everything you are and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said the whole law and prophets hang on that. Now in the New Testament... Last Wednesday night we taught that um, in in, um, Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus could, if you want to live under the law of Moses, you make Jesus an outlaw. Because a high priest under the law of Moses had to be from the tribe of Levi and a direct descendant of Moses' brother Aaron. Jesus was neither. He was of the tribe of Judah. They called him uh, pr- proverbially, they called him the son of David because David was from the tribe of Judah. And so Jesus, under the law of Moses, cannot be your high priest. So if you accept Christ as the high priest of your faith and then want to live under the law, you make Jesus a lawbreaker. So in Hebrews 7, the author of Hebrews says, where there's a changing of the priesthood, Jesus was not a priest after the order of Aaron. The psalmist David first talked about it, and the author of Hebrews grabbed a hold of it. And he said that Jesus is made a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we explained some about Melchizedek on on Wednesday night, but I don't want to take that time today and run out of time for today's lesson. Uh, but he was an Old Testament character who was a priest, and Abraham paid tithes to him on uh, the occasion after the victory of uh, Abraham's shepherds against the uh, Three Army Coalition. And um, after they won, Abraham recovered everything for those cities, uh, the four cities that lost to the three cities. 
And they said, keep it on. He said, no, no, I'm not going to let anyone say you made me rich. But he kept out two, two sets, two stipends of money. One tenth, the tithe of all the treasure he recovered for those cities, he gave to this man called Melchizedek as a tithe. And then he also kept out a stipend to pay the shepherds that went to battle with them. Other than that, all the rest of the money was returned to the four cities that had been conquered by the three cities. And uh, so David prophesied long after that. David was a long time after Abraham. That somebody was coming. He said, The Lord has said unto my Lord, Thou, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And uh, when you read the words of Jesus, and we included those in our lesson last week, um, Jesus took that passage from Psalms and referred it to himself. In other words, when he wrote, "My the Lord said unto my Lord, the my Lord in that was Jesus. So David somehow gets a front row seat to God the Father and God the uh, Son talking to each other. Don't know if he had a queer vision or just a revelation in his mind or what the deal was. But he heard God Jehovah the Father saying to God the Son, Jesus, Thou art forever a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So in Hebrews, it said in chapter 7, where there is the changing of the priesthood. You're changing the priesthood from Aaron to Melchizedek or the one who's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus. When there, Hebrews 7 said, where there's a changing of the priesthood, it necessitates, it makes necessary the changing of the law. You can't live under the law of Moses and have Jesus as a high priest. When he became high priest, the law had to change. And so we showed you what Jesus did last Wednesday on the night he was betrayed in the upper room. He looked at his disciples and said, A new commandment give I unto you, that you should love one another even as I have loved you. And so, and he said, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. All, everybody watching, if you live the way Jesus wants you to live, will know we're the real deal as far as being followers of Christ. They might not be converted. They might not even believe Christ is God. But nonetheless, they'll know that we're sincere followers of Christ if we love one another. And uh, so it's a different rule than loving your neighbor as yourself. That one was tough enough, but this one's tougher. i got to love you the way Jesus loves me. And you don't make it easy. But that's okay. you got to love me the way Jesus loves you. And I don't make it easy either. I'm going to even know we're flawed people. So we set up a new thing. So um, we talked, I think last week, let me not get ahead of myself. Yeah, last week we, um, we talked about, in Galatians 5, it said that, um, oh, let me get my train of thought of how uh, the verse began. Um, you have been called on to liberty, which means freedom. Only use not liberty or this Christian freedom as a base of operations for the flesh. Uh, the King James uses the word as an, an occasion to the flesh. And in the Greek, that's primarily a military term talking about where the generals have their base to give orders to all the soldiers out here fighting. So, Paul is writing to the Galatians, yeah, you've been called to liberty, but don't use that freedom as an excuse for bad conduct. So what's the restraint? Nobody's going to stone you. We're not under the law of Moses. So what's the restraint? He said, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. The commandment he gave in the upper room the night before he died, was the changing of the law that made the priesthood of Jesus legal. 
And this law is, we must love one another even as Jesus loved us. And that's a tall order. And do you know the day that Jesus saved me? He knew every dark secret of mine. He knew every filthy sin I had ever committed. And he saved me anyway. But wait, there's more. That day he saved me, he knew every filthy sin I would commit after I become a Christian. And he saved me anyway. And then he tells me I gotta love you like that. That's a tough one. But what's Paul saying? You live under this law and you'll treat your neighbors right. Your fellow believers. In the New Test in the Old Testament, treat uh, love your neighbor primarily talking about your fellow Jews. In the New Testament, when it said, love one another as I love you, it's primarily talking about Christians, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. So, our first command is to love our fellow Christians. Now, are we to love the non-Christians? Of course we are. But that's not what the Bible stresses to us. It teaches that, but it stresses love each other. Because that's the only way we're going to win in the end of the world, is loving each other. If people look into this church and see biting and devouring, you think they'd want that? They say, why should I go there? I already got that. I'm fighting with all my relatives, all my neighbors. I'm fighting with everyone. I don't have to go there and fight. they got to see something different in believers to want what we have. And that's the message of Jesus. So let's go to this week. You want to overcome some of your bad habits, some of your sins in your life? We've been saved a long time, most of us. Do you know God has given us everything we need? Now listen carefully. God has given us through Jesus everything we need to overcome every sin in our lives. But do you know anyone who's done it yet? We don't have to look to God for more. He's already given it to us we got to learn to understand it. Because the victory that overcomes the world, according to John in 1 John 5, is faith. What is faith? It's believing something. And when we talk about Christian faith, we're talking about believing what God said to us through His Word about us. Why did Abraham, why did it say when Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness? He didn't have just a generic faith. He didn't. It wasn't because he believed in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. It's because he was reconvinced after a time of doubt that God would use that old wife of his to give him the promised child that would carry on the covenant that God made with Abraham. It would then go to Isaac and it would then go to Jacob, Isaac's son. And now Sarah had always been barren. She couldn't give birth, and now she had went through the change in life. It was twice impossible for her to have a baby. But when he doubted, God encouraged him, and he believed again. He believed what God said to him, about him, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So, that, and he is called in Paul's writings, the father of the faith. So he's not just the father of Israel, his natural descendants. All Christians are his spiritual descendants. Because we are saved the way he was declared righteous. By believing what God says about us, to us. What did God say about me, to me? He said, if any man believe in him, he should not perish, but have everlasting life. Guess what? I'm any man. God said that about me, to me. In John 3.16, I believed it. What's the result? It was counted on to me for righteousness. I became right with God when I put my faith in Jesus Christ. All right? So, now let's look at uh, verse 16 on the bottom part. Want to overcome, then walk in the Spirit. This I say then, walk in the Spirit... And you shall not fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh. That's what the word lust means, our desires. So, the only way you quit doing what your flesh wants to do, Romans 7 teaches us that even though we get saved when we put our faith in Christ, our body 
doesn't get saved. That doesn't get saved till we get out there on the journey. We got to see Jesus as he is according to 1 John 3, 2. We got to see Jesus in the fullness of his glory. When we see him as he is, we become like him. Then our body is saved. It'll no longer age. It'll be transformed into a new body. It'll never age again. And do you know, in heaven throughout eternal days, you will never sin again. Ever. I like that. All the gritting your teeth and trying, and that's one of the reasons we're not more, more successful, gritting your teeth and trying doesn't help you overcome. It helps you in other areas of life. It helps you get your raise at work. It helps you get your promotion at work. It helps you make the first string in football, gritting your teeth and trying harder. But gritting your teeth and trying harder doesn't get you anywhere with God. Believing what God says about you to you, that's what helps you in your relationship with God. So you got to delve into the Scripture in the New Testament and find out what God says about you. If you're comfortable just sitting there, never picking up a Bible, never studying it, you're going to have trouble getting any closer in your walk with God than you are right now. Still go to heaven, but you won't live a victorious life on this planet unless you start digging into what did God say to you about you in His Word. And when you do that, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When you start seeing that, you think, oh my God. Faith begins to spring forth in you. So that's the secret. Now, what does it mean? Paul says here, you've got to walk in the Spirit if you want to quit sinning. Talking to Christians. You want to quit sinning, you've got to walk in the Spirit. What's that mean? Well... It doesn't, it's not as difficult to explain as you think. I'm going to take you back a couple chapters from chapter 5 to chapter 3. Two of my favorite verses in the New Testament, verses 2 and 3 of Galatians 3. The Apostle Paul writes, This only what I learn of you. Receive you the Spirit. Now, he's not talking some Pentecostal doctrine here about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. He's talking about how you get saved. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you. So, he's saying, I got a simple question for you. Received you the Spirit, or, let's put it in words, you can wrap your mind around, did you get saved by? So he said, I just want to learn this from you. Did you get saved by, or received you the Spirit by, the works of the law, by gritting your teeth and trying really hard? Or, by the hearing of faith? That's what's called a rhetorical question, meaning it has an understood answer. The understood answer is your works didn't save you. If you've ever read the New Testament, you know that. Your works didn't save you. If any man believes on him, he shall not perish but have everlasting life. Your faith saved you. So verse 2 is a rhetorical question with an understood answer. How do you get saved? By keeping the rules or by believing what God said about you to you? And then verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You say, what? Up here in verse 2, he's got works of the law, hearing of faith. He's got two different things in verse 3. In the Spirit, by the flesh. But they're not different. Verse 3 explains what those two phrases in verse 2 mean. So when he said, did you get saved by the works of the law? In verse in verse 2 and verse 3, that means by the flesh. By you trying. Is that what saved you? You were so good at keeping the rules. That's walking in the flesh. Or did you get uh, saved? Did your salvation walk begin in the Spirit? Now, what's in the Spirit related to verse 2? It's the hearing of faith. 
So whenever you read Paul's epistles and you see phrases like in the Spirit, by the Spirit, through the Spirit, of the Spirit, in the flesh, by the flesh, through the flesh, uh, of the flesh, when you read those things, you now know what he's talking about. Of the flesh, by the flesh, through the flesh, means you're trying to get good enough to go to heaven. Like your friend at work. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something, folks. There was only one guy ever lived who was good enough to go to heaven, and he came from heaven, and that was Jesus. You and I fall a trillion grand canyons short of being good enough to go to heaven. The first time you sinned, whenever God saw that you had reached this age of accountability the first time you sinned after that you were lost and there was nothing you could do about it doesn't matter if you kept the rules from that day on you already broke one and perfection is demanded I wrote the song a big red F that explained all that and once you get that big red F you had no way to save yourself Jesus had to come take the test for you. And he didn't miss a single one. And so when you put your faith in him, God changed your F to an A. That's the good news. A A, A whatever. Um, The A that gets you to heaven. God sees you as righteous before him. The way he looked at the flawed Abraham and counted his faith for righteousness. He looks at the flawed you and sees you as right with him. When the Bible talks about righteousness in the New Testament, it's in essence talking about the act of justification where God put on his judicial robe as judge in the courtrooms of heaven. Jesus pointed me out and said, Father, he's one of mine. God brought the gavel down and said, I declare him right with me. That's what righteousness is. I've been declared by God Himself as being in a right relationship with Him. Nothing separates me from Him. Nothing. The Old Testament, God said, I'm not deaf, I still hear. My arm's not short and I can still save, but your sins have separated you from me. You will never read that in the New Testament about Christians. Ever. Ever. Nothing separates his children from him. All right? So, that's the good news of the gospel. So, walking in the Spirit is believing what God said to you about you. I really want you to wrap your brain around that. Abraham believed a lot of good things about God, but none of them made him righteous. But when he believed what God said to him about him, your wife's going to have that baby. don't care how old she is. I don't care if she's been barren her entire life. She's going to have that baby. And the lights went on in Abraham's head. And he believed God. And God counted it as being right with him. And... Romans 4 teaches me that I get that experience the same way Abraham did, through faith. All right? So now, why don't we believe the promises? I put down here, I'm struggling with sin, and there's a promise of God that I don't believe. Because Jesus said, uh, in his script, and Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So, If I'm not free as a Christian, if I'm walking in bondage to some bad behavior, that means there's a truth I don't know yet. Because he said, continue in my word and you will know the truth. Now, there's no shortcuts, folks. If you're not in this, you're not going to learn any new truths. People will buy a book written by a billionaire, How to Get Rich, and read every stinking word in that book. This book, expressly the New Testament, tells you how to get right with God, how to walk with God, how to overcome sin, and very few people ever pick it up. They think, that's what I pay the preacher for. Well, that helps the preacher. 
you know, if, if this book benefits me, I'm not going to leave it to someone else to get it all to me. No, the preacher is one way God will speak to you. Do you know you're responsible for what you believe, not me? If I preach bad, don't get me wrong. If I preach a scriptural air as a preacher in front of this church, I'll answer to God uh, why I was teaching air. If it's intentional, it could keep me out of heaven. And I'll guarantee you I've never once intentionally preached air. But none of us preachers got everything 100% right. But the bottom line is, you're going to hear one preacher say this, another preacher say this. God holds you responsible for what you believe. That's why I hand out notes. I say, don't believe it because I said it. Study it and see if you reach the same conclusion. Because if you believe it because I said it, that's my revelation. It's not yours. It'll help me in the trial. It won't help you in the temptation. It's got to be something you know. And so... I hand these things out thinking, take them home and I'm trying to make study easy. Take them home and study. And you know, if you study the notes at home, guess what's going to happen? You're going to become more and more proficient at studying and you're going to find other avenues of studying that don't include my notes. And you won't necessarily come away believing everything I believe. But at least what you believe, you will have reached the conclusion that God has shown you that, and now it can be a benefit to you in the trial. I've said this over the years. What I know doesn't help you in the trial. There are times when what I know doesn't help me in the trial. Because I know it here, but I haven't really believed it yet. But you've got to know it here first before you can wrap your faith around it. I tell you, the more I study, the hungrier I get to study. I learn every single time I sit down to make a sermon. Every night I sit down to write a verse or two of commentary. I just finished Romans 12 and started on Romans 13. I wonder how could I have been so stupid way back then. Listen to me again. Every time I study, I learn something. How dumb was I 40 years ago? And God loved me anyway, just as much as He loves me now. But it makes you want to study. When you're studying and the lights go on in an area. Sometimes they're not life-changing areas. They're just new information. But it's exciting to see something you didn't see before you sat down. And you think you and God are having discussions here and He's showing you stuff. And if that doesn't rev you up, I don't know what will spiritually. But anyway, I'll flip that over real quick. And um, look, look at verse 7 on the other side. And this is in the Good News Bible. For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants. And what the Spirit wants is opposed to what our human nature wants. These two are enemies, and this means that you cannot do what you want to do. So the flesh, now in the King James, the word is lust there. The Spirit lusteth after the flesh, and the flesh lusteth after the Spirit. And the word lust means desires. And so what it's saying is the Holy Spirit desires one thing for you and your flesh desires another thing for you. So your flesh and, your, and the Holy Spirit are at war in that sense. Some would argue that the Spirit there is your redeemed Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. But the result uh, remains the same. What is of God in you desires one thing. What is of the flesh in you desires another. There's a conflict. And so we have to understand that. Romans 7 down below said, um, the law is spiritual, but, but I'm not. It said, but I'm carnal, so to understand. And so, man, I wish I had about another 20 hours. Um, you think I'm joking. If you could stay awake, I could talk. But anyway, I tell my friend at work that I take breaks with. He's... Um, Catholic gentleman and um, I asked him one day 
I said, he, lo- he loves God. I have no doubt about that. But the doctrine that he has is not good. I asked him one day, you're driving home from work, and you give in to the desires of your flesh, and in your mind you have an adulterous relationship with another woman. You pull in, turn the car off at home, get out of the car and drop dead of a heart attack before you had a chance to repent. Heaven or hell? He said, hell. I said, so you're not saved. He said, yeah, but i got to live right. When I think I have to live right, I put myself back under the rules. And the rules can't be kept by the flesh. I don't live right First of all, I'm not saved because of what I do or don't do. I am saved because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on my behalf. He died for my sins. That's the only reason I'm saved. You say, are you telling, he asked me, are you telling me I can do whatever I want? I said, yes! I said, read Romans 7. Romans 7 tells me the problem isn't my doing what I want. My problem is doing what I hate. When you get saved, you hate sin. You don't want to sin against a God that you're head over heels in love with. The struggle in Romans 7 isn't about me doing what I want. Because what I want, as she's saying in a song, I pant after God like the deer after the water brook. I want to please God. That's what I want. But the sin in my flesh that dwells there wants me to enjoy evil. It wants me to do things I hate. But it has a technique to make me think I'll really enjoy what I hate. And so it tempts me. And Paul, putting himself in my shoes, says in Romans 7, I do what I hate and don't do what I want to do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Folks, I want to tell you again, if you're truly saved... You pant after God. You want to please God. You're not looking for ways of sin. If you're not truly hungry for God, you'll take some of what I'm saying here. He said I can do whatever I want. And forget the other part I told you. you got to be in love with Jesus for that to work. Because if you're in love with Jesus, what you want to do is please Him. I use my wife for an example. I've been married to her for a long time. If I really love her, am I going to call another woman tonight when she goes to bed and sneak out and cheat on her? No. Would that be love? That would be love. So, my point is, loving people and loving God is the restraint that keeps me walking for God. If I love you, I'm not going to cheat with your wife. I'm not going to steal your money. I'm not going to spread bad rumors about you. If I love God, I'm going to want to please Him. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. And there are several verses there. Um, And so he said in Romans 7, 21, So I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. As long as you're living in this body, evil is always going to be there. The tempter, because the devil can tempt the flesh, because the flesh has sin dwelling in it. Guess what? This flesh isn't going to heaven. When I go to heaven, when I get to heaven, this flesh won't be there. So, what's it say? The problem is, I don't truly believe that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus if I sin. That's the problem. If I'm really still sinning, I haven't bought into what God said. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Again, that's what God said to me, about me. He said, if you're in me, you're a brand new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He said that to me about me in his word. He said it to you and about you. So if I'm not acting that way, it's because I haven't believed what he said. I said, well, you say I'm a new creation, creation, but I still act like I used to. The word doesn't help you. That's like going on a diet to lose 100 pounds and you're lost. 45 and you say this diet's not working I wanted to lose 100 well you're 55 pounds 
or 45 pounds closer to that than you were before the diet. The point I'm getting at is you and I'll never be perfect. But when we believe what God says about us to us, we'll find it easier and easier and easier to walk out this Christian life. All right, and then down verse 18. If you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the wall. So, if you let the Holy Spirit live in your life, you don't need the law of Moses. The Holy Spirit's going to take you by the hand, and the two of you are going to get some things done. So, um, and good things, positive things. Galatians 5.16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's a promise. You walk in the Spirit, you will not live a life of sin. That's a promise from God to me about me. This is what God said to me about me. These are the good things if you believe you are righteous before God. God said this to me about me. If I walk in the Spirit, I will not fulfill the desires of my flesh that has sin dwelling in its members. That's what God said. First John 5, 4, who, Whatsoever born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. God said that about me to me. He said, you're in Jesus. You're born of God. You're a Christian. You've overcome the world. I'll never overcome the world until I know or understand that I have overcome the world. i got to know what my position in Christ is. I am a overcomer of the world. And when I believe that, then I begin to walk it out. So, again, down Galatians 5, 13, 14, as we wrap this up. Brethren, you have been called unto liberty, which means freedom. Only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. If we can get that love down pat. Loving God is presupposed in the epistles so it stresses loving each other the writers of the epistles presuppose that if you're a Christian you love God so it stresses faith in God more than loving God because that's a presupposition of the writers you can't truly be a Christian and not love God so it doesn't hammer loving God like the Old Testament, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But it hammers loving each other. And it hammers have faith in God. The God you love, put your faith in Him and believe what He says about you. And if you do, you will be amazed at the turnaround. And in conclusion, if I don't eat, I'm going to get very, very weak and eventually die. If I'm not interested in what the Bible says, I'm not going to lead a healthy Christian life. Period. i got to care what it says. And if I care what it says, I'm going to open it up and see what it says. And I would uh, give you the encouragement to make at least 80% of your Bible study in the New Testament. Because that's what the good promises are. That's the covenant we're under.